On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Brian McHenry and Heather Williams to talk about Google collecting your location data, even though you don't want them to. And we have a great guest, Andrew Osted, co-founder of Airtable, to talk how the spreadsheet meets the database. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 305, recorded August 24th, 2018. Airtable data for the masses. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. And by DigitalOcean. The easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Lou Maresca, your guide through all things in the enterprise. But who wants to go on a journey on, in this big world alone? Now, Cheever is safely hiding away from Hurricane Lane, and Curtis is moving. So today we have a new cast of misfits to joining me. So joining me as one of our co-hosts in crime today, Mr. Brian McHenry from F5 Networks. Bam, how are you today, my friend? I'm doing well, Lou. How are you? I'm doing great, doing great. Now, you uh, you have some events coming up soon, right? I actually just came out of uh, F5's Agility Conference and um, learned something new. Uh, apparently, my job is changing, so I'm actually uh, not the Global Customer Solutions Lead any longer as of this week. I am actually now... Uh, the lead for our security solutions architects. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we're looking forward to see how that uh, how that plays out. We got kinds of things you get to do. Fantastic. Well, we're we're hoping uh, we actually have another co-host joining us today, and that is Mo Williams, Heather Williams, sort of senior staff product solutions architect from Ruckus Networks. Welcome back, Heather. Thank you. Does it feel a little like we don't have adult supervision today? I, I think so. I think so. Chibert's not here to yell at us and tell us to do things. So I think we'll have to uh, figure it out for ourselves. But uh, you've survived all your travels and our preliminary internet streaming test over the past week, which is great. Yes, it is. And clean socks <laughs> are a good thing. <laughs> That's right. Happy to be home. Fantastic. Well, we're hoping uh, soon to upgrade Heather from guest co-host to reoccurring co-host as we stress test her network. So we're looking forward to seeing how that goes. But let's start by stress testing Heather's network by starting the show. And of course, we have a good one today. We're talking about Google's facing a lawsuit on collecting your location data. And we also have a great guest, Airtable, who's changing the way you store your data and interact with data. But first... Like we always do, let's jump into the blips. Now, how have you felt that Facebook Messenger was a secure way to communicate? I hope not, because the Electronic Foundation, the Electronic Fund Frontier Foundation, or EFF, surely doesn't think you should be banking on its security. Now, this past week, the EFF took to the internet to proclaim its distrust in the Justice Department and also Facebook's Messenger securing your content. Now, the F, as the EFF describes it, unlike Signal and WhatsApp, Messenger is not marked as a secure or encrypted means of communication. Messenger does have the option to enable secret text conversations, which actually enables end-to-end -end encryption by ways of the Signal protocol, which actually is also used by WhatsApp. But there is the kicker here. End-to-end -end encryption is not an option for messenger voice calls. Now, where does the Justice Department play in this proclamation? Well, the Justice Department recently demanded that Facebook help them intercept messenger voice calls. The wiretap order and related court proceedings arose from an investigation of the MS-13 gang in Fresno, California. Now, even though Facebook messenger protocol is not publicly document documented, it's not hard to reverse engineer. Messenger uses a standard protocol called WebRTC, 
for both voice and video connections. Now, WebRTC relies on a messenger to actually set up a connection between the two parties for the call, which doesn't get routed or streamed through Facebook servers. Now, the voice data is encrypted with something called a session key to ensure that a nosy network administrator sitting between the two parties can't listen in. Now, what does what actually goes through the Facebook servers? Well, the session key that encrypts the voice data, of course. Unfortunately, that makes it not a real end-to-end -end encryption. So remember the Apple versus the FBI on encryption? Well, one difference on the legal front is that Apple's case turned on the All Writs Act, whereas here the government is almost certainly relying on the technical assistance provision of the Wiretap Act in regard to Facebook. Now, if nothing else, this is just another case that proves we should all be paying attention to security and how our data could possibly be handled by third parties. Sextortion is not just another Anthony Weiner joke. Sure, I could have talked to you about the near-field communications data breach at Black Hat, Black Hat that was reported by Zach Whitaker in TechCrunch, but let's face it, RSA already took that headline earlier this year. Instead, let's talk about this week's motherboard article by Joseph Cox. In a mux of extortion and phishing, victims are being scammed of thousands of dollars in Bitcoin. A report by Brian Krebs last month described an email campaign that revealed a fairly old hassle password once uh, used by the victim and a claim that the hacker was in possession of contact lists and social media login information. The emails also claimed that hijacked web camera footage made while the victim was surfing porn sites would be sent out unless a one-time payment was made. The twist is that the passwords were likely obtained through an already public breach and the video is just made up. This news ar new article reveals that the Intimidation Act uh, tactic has been pretty profitable, conservatively at least half a billion dollars. I'm sorry, half a million dollars. Half a billion would have been more than slightly profitable um, <laughs> for what amounts to low-level social engineering work and not much effort. Hey, why hack them if you can just convince them you did? Net neutrality debates heat up again after Verizon throttles a fire department. Verizon admitted that they should have stopped throttling the Santa Clara County Fire Department after they declared they were dealing with an emergency situation. The Santa Clara Fire Department had exceeded their 25 gigabyte data limit while fighting a fire and were throttled as per their contract terms. Santa Clara County was not satisfied by this apology, of course, and have pointed to the repeal of net neutrality as being at the core of the problem. In a press release, Santa Clara officials stated that the, with out net neutrality restrictions, ISPs would routinely act in their own economic self-interest, even at the expense of public safety. Verizon, of course, denies their claim, stating that this has nothing to do with net neutrality. It was only the result of a customer service error. The service impacted was the same cellular gateway devices used to track and manage emergency service vehicles, coincidentally revealed to be vulnerable to exploit in research presented at Black Hat USA just three weeks ago. While the cause of this issue is likely due to customer service error, as Verizon stated, the lack of net neutrality restrictions mean that there is less recourse for Santa Clara County and other ISP customers when vet events like this one do occur. The focus of many net neutrality debates have centered on streaming services that might compete with the in in interests of the service provider. However, this particular incident highlights how the lack of net neutrality regulations can easily be abused by ISPs to avoid liability, even in instances where public safety is impacted. Surprise! More of your data was leaked. And who was it this time? Well, it was a corporation who's actually proclaimed that they, I quote, their security is amazingly good. Now, late last night, T-Mobile, that's right, Deutsche Call Telekom SoftBank's U U.S. subsidiary, who will soon own Sprint, revealed that hackers stole some personal data of 2 million people in a new data breach. What data was included in that breach? Well, the normal pieces of data, your name, your email, your address, your account number, and some of your billing information. Now, if you want to look on the bright side, your credit cards were not included, as well as the social security number and passwords were not leaked. When was the leak detected? Well, Monday, August 20th, the T-Mobile cyber team discovered and shut down access to the information. Now, although the announcement is not 24 hours after the detection of the breach, it's better than months later. Now, who were the hackers? Well, at this point, it's been revealed that it's the, an international group actually accessing numerous servers from the company through an API that was exposed by the corporation, but there's no other details of that group. Unfortunately, this is not the first time T-Mobile had issues with data breaches. Back in 2017, there was a breach in the company's website. And in 2016, there was also a massive breach for 15 million people. Even this past February, T-Mobile sent out a text warning customers of a SIM swapping threat. Now, if nothing else, I am truly amazed on how good security is. Well done, T-Mobile. 
Telling the story of NotPetya, currently the most devastating cyber attack in history. Andy Gr Greenberg for Wired Magazine spent almost a year researching the behind-the-scenes events from last year's NotPetya attack. It's a disturbingly gripping account that describes the destruction of the Ukraine's infrastructure in a, quote, massive coordinated cyber invasion, unquote. And then as the warm raced around the world, the, gripping, the crippling of networks from uh, hospitals in Pennsylvania to the chocolate factory in, Tans in Tasmania. And while Maersk, a Danish maritime giant responsible for 76 ports globally, 800 seafaring vessels, and 20% of the entire world's shipping capacity is the face of much of the article, I'd like to focus on another multinational company that was severely affected, Merck, the pharmaceutical giant, which is briefly mentioned in the article. Shortly after the initial atta attack, Merck announced that the production of the hepatitis B vaccine had been crippled, but no shortage was expected. Hepatitis B is a virus that causes an acute or a chronic infection of the liver. By fall of last year, Merck acknowledged that there would be a shortage in the Hep B vaccine for the rest of the year. The current CDC advisory is that the shortage is ongoing for both pediatric and adult vaccines and that Merck will not be resuming production for the rest of this year. The NotPetya attack began, at least at the first, as an assault on one nation by another. But like bio-warfare, any cyber warfare attack once begun has no way of being contained, and this one even spreading back to Russia and hitting their state oil company, Rosneft. And herein lies the cautionary tale. As we have learned from the Matthew Broderick film, War Games, the only way to win is not to play this game. Tesla is building its own AI chips for self-driving cars. Tesla announced this week that they would... <clears throat> be producing their own in-car compute hardware known as the Hardware 3. This move signals Tesla's desire to push self-driving vehicles to the next level. Although Tesla has struggled to achieve profitability, particularly due to Model 3 production challenges, they see this announcement as key to their long-term viability. By developing their own chips in-house, they can tailor the capabilities to the specific needs of their autonomous vehicle, AI, and the neural network connecting the entire fleet of Tesla vehicles. Producing the compute hardware is similar to the battery innovation that Tesla has driven by not sourcing OEM batteries for their vehicles. If their autonomous vehicle AI proves to be superior, expect it to see it drive innovation, if not outright OEM adoption from other car manufacturers. I, for one, agree that leadership in self-driving AI, much like battery energy density, is key to winning the race for the dominant vehicle manufacturer of the future. Now, have you ever been stopped by TSA or an airline in order to take your batteries or your devices out of your bag? Well, they're fearful of fire or explosions on the flight due to those batteries. Now, in the past several years, lithium-ion batteries have been wreaking havoc on airline flights and in waste facilities. Now, Tesla Motors is no stranger to this issue with batteries based on several of their car fires over the years due to these components. Well, science, scientists at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory might have the secret sauce to combating our lithium ion woes. A lithium battery has two electrodes separate from, separated by a thin plastic sheet and submerged in a liquid electrolyte that's a chemical medium, usually a flammable lithium ion flu fluid. That, that fluid allows a charge to flow between the two ion cathodes to a carbon anode. Now, if the plastic sheet breaks, the two electrodes touch, sparking a potential fire. Now, what if the electrodes were submerged in a non-flammable solid electrolyte? Well, all it takes is a cheap recipe alteration. Now, how is it discovered? Physicist Gabriel V found this amazing discovery while he was introducing his kids to a cornstarch and water mixture called Ublek. Now, surprisingly, Ublek is a Dr. Seuss's named substance that is a non-Newtonian fluid, which means viscosity changes in response to shearing force. Now, how can it change the battery substrate to make the same to make on take on the same properties? Well, just suspend a sphere-shaped silica nanoparticle in the usual liquid of electrolytes used for lithium-ion batteries, and your work is done. Now, this might be enough simplicity that the lithium-ion manufacturers will be willing to adopt it and make it safer for all cell phone travelers worldwide. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Rocket Mortgage. Now, home buying is not easy. It's quite stressful. Now, I remember buying my last house. It was actually not very fun. I had to deal with multiple banks. And not only did I have to search for data and deals with bank representatives on and off for weeks, I had to worry about interest rate hikes as well. And it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking, and it seems to take 
forever. Now, the market today is unpredictable, which means interest rates are changing all the time and it causes lots of anxiety. Well, our friends at Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage noticed all these issues and they created a system that should hopefully fix the problem. Now, they're calling it the power buying process. Now, here's how it works. Quicken Loans will verify your income, assets, credit in less than 24 hours, and then you, they give you a verified approval. Now, what is that? Well, that gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Now, in this current market, the strength of a cash buyer is a huge advantage because sometimes you have to go and put in an offer at a moment's notice, sometimes right at an open house. So this actually makes it a lot easier. Now, once you're verified, you qualify for their all new exclusive rate shield approval. Now, first, they'll lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. And now here's the best part. If the rates go up, your rate stays the same. Now, if you're probably thinking, well, if the rate goes down, they won't tell me. Nope. If the rate goes down, your rate also drops. Now, if you ask me as a buyer, you seem to have the upper hand here because either way, you win. Now, if you're thinking about buying a house, go out right now to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. And in less than 10 minutes, your info could be entered and you can be on your way to home buying freedom. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumeraccess.org number 3030. That is rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, that does it. For the blips, first, let's go ahead and jump into our first bite here. And we're talking a little bit about Google and how they're getting a little bit of in trouble on some of their data collection issues. Now, they're just not kind of having a good year. First, they were fined 4.3 billion euros or $5 billion for antitrust violations in the EU, which they had it had to do actually with them tying their search and their browser apps to the Android operating system. Now they're actually under fire with because of their Google services on Android and iPhone store apps because of their location data. Even if you opt out of that location data, it seems like Google is still collecting your data. Now, in the app like Google, Google Maps, it will remind you to actually allow access to your location data if you're using it for navigation. If you agree to let it record your location data, Google Maps will display the history for you in a timeline that maps out your daily movements. Now, in the lawsuit that was against mm -hmm. Google, by a Google user, Napoleon Pascals, feels Google is falsely representing themselves when privacy settings, even though they are still collecting data when you disable it. Now, the lawsuit seeks to represent all Google, Google mo mobile users, both on Android devices and iPhones, and claims that the search giant, giant violated privacy laws, including the California Invasion of Privacy Act and the right to privacy enshrined in the California Constitution. Now, this is not the first time Google was under scrutiny for location data practices. Back in November, it was recognized that Android users' location data being collected even when the location services setting was turned off. So I, first, I want to throw it to you guys. I think starting with Heather, data security, data integrity, privacy, these are all things that are kind of under a microscope the past several years. And and this is not this is just not the beginning of this. Um, are companies like Google being too cavalier with data like this? What do you think, Heather? Well, I think that I made light of this story uh, just last week. and um, But that I think that privacy truly should be a priority. And if they're taking it lightly now, they probably need to rethink that. I'm somebody who picked up a stalker via Facebook years ago. Um, and I had a good friend who started her own version of sleeping with the enemy um, by being cyber stalked by a spouse. So privacy issues are actually pretty serious. And, and you uh, mentioned uh, EFF.org earlier in the show, and I'm a, a, a big supporter of them. And I think that going forward, this is going to be something that we're not going to be scoffing at. Right, right. What about you, Bam? I think, you know, to me, it seems like companies are, you know, they're saying, hey, we're going to we're going to collect some data. Um, it's not PII data, but um, it's just basic information. Um, in this case, it's actually location information. Or do you think that maybe Google here is a little, being a little bit too cavalier with that data, that type of data? Uh, I, you know, so you can, I can play devil's advocate here, right? I'm I'm a big privacy advocate. Uh, I talk about you know using encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, wherever possible, whenever you can. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing here is that any slight misstep or even perceived misstep is getting really uh, 
put under a microscope, as you said. The question that I would have for Google is not whether or not they're collecting the, the location data, but how is that data stored, right? Uh, what's the context of the storage? And that's the thing that, that really is important to me. Are they storing just generic location data to see where the distribution of users is for Messenger or for their other services and it's anonymized? I wouldn't have a problem with that, right? That probably helps them develop uh, better classes of service, build a better network that makes my experience better. However, if they're storing that location data with my per my PII data, that's context, right? So we've got to kind of take a look, right? So they might be collecting that data, um, but is it being used uh, in a in, in a way that's nefarious? Is it being stored in a way that it could be resold, or if it was compromised, could be really used? in some evil way against me? Or is it just anonymous location data say, this is generically where users of a certain app are? And that's that's data that's probably very powerful for them to build better services. Um, and then also the, the other data storage issue is, is to consider, is it long-term storage or is it being collected and stored very ephemerally um, for 24 hours or even an hour or or even a week or a month? Is it, Or is it something that's just stored and it's just in this massive, multi-petabyte, you know, Google data store of location information. Right. Yeah, I think you kind of bring up a good point because they, they do make profit off of some of this data by using it in some means. But the interesting thing is Google Google kind of make the major, major source of money, obviously, is ads. And they make it off of you using their search and then obviously you jumping on their ads that are actually relevant to you. And sometimes location is a big piece of that puzzle. So Heather, what do you think? Is this is this something that we're going to see more and more from companies? I mean, obviously, companies like Google need this data, especially data about you, so that they can make better decisions and more targeted decisions about you. Is this just something that we have to start regulating? Do you really, I guess the better question is, do you have a right to disappear? Do you have a right to turn that data off? I like to think that I, I do. So, yeah, I, th I think that this is something that is, if they can monetize it, they will. Um, and the question that I have for BAM is if they are storing it long term without context, is there a way to contextualize it later on? Um, I never um, I trust no one. Right. That's a good question. What do you think, BAM? So so I, so I think I think that's the question, right? It's the it goes back to, um, you know, Snowden and talking about. Oh, the Prism program, not such a big deal. It's just metadata. Uh, you know, the you know the various you know uh, NSA s snooping that that was going on. It, you know, when they say just metadata to try to get us to kind of back off and leave them alone, that's a great question, right? Is it is it truly just metadata? W what we found out later is the metadata that was being you know tracked by the NSA was was anything but anonymized, right? It was very easy to figure out who, what, where, and when. Um, from that data, and that's why they were collecting it, of course. So we we have a, a responsibility as uh, citizens to, to hold these corporations, uh, hold governments responsible for how they store our data, how they use it after the fact, and to demonstrate uh, due diligence. You know, right. we talked about GPDR a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's a nice thing on paper, but I, I see it as largely unenforceable as as this particular incident kind of shows. Right. Yeah, that's interesting because it, with GDPR, obviously, uh, customers are supposed to be able to control their data. But if there's no way to identify that data as being linked to you, there's no need for for the corporations to make any use out of it or delete it or get rid of it or even link it to you in any way. So that's inter that's an interesting take on that. Um, I think one thing that's interesting, though, I, I wanted to bring up in this case is the fact that there's been a couple, multiple cases here where even though you turn your location data off for this app, for these apps or services, they can somehow still collect it. So that's, I, I'm not sure if that maybe be a case for the operating system or even the hardware companies that are, that are maintaining these OSs that you can build these apps on. I mean, obviously, they put these settings there for a reason. Um, somehow these apps are circumventing that. I don't know. I mean, what do you what do you what do you guys think? Is this something that we should that that companies like Apple and and Google they should be paying attention to more, or or maybe even looking in the code to make sure there's no way to circumvent that? So that's a a great point, and it really speaks to what's what's our recourse as as citizens, right? We're we're relying on security researchers largely to to tell us whether these companies are doing their job in terms of developing secure APIs, 
uh, you know, doing a good job of uh, data storage. And, you know, we, we don't have answers. Most of us don't have answers, right? The, the three of us on this, this uh, little informal chat here are, are a little more informed than most people, but I don't think any, any one of the three of us could really lay claim to being able to assert uh, whether anyone's done their due diligence uh, around the storage of our data. So that speaks to a whole other, you know, soapbox I could get up onto about the <laughs> CFAA and and how we prosecute, uh, you know, so-called hackers versus security researchers and where do you draw the line? Um, and we don't really have good representation in government right now to to establish the importance of, of a security researcher. Right. Yeah, well, I think I, I think this is interesting. Go ahead, Heather. Yep. Sorry, I was going to say we should definitely draw the line behind the guy that they arrested last year at DEF CON. But I think I can summarize uh, everything that Bam so nicely said in uh, by quoting uh, Stan Lee, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> it seems to apply a lot of places, I think. So, uh, But let's leave it there. I think we have another good uh, bite we can jump into. And this is a little bit more uplifting, uh, but actually interesting, I think. So, you know, groceries delivery is, is something that's kind of a slight saver. I've used it many times. My family uses it. It's amazing. I imagine being sick and you need to get your groceries for your family and bam, they're at your door. And I'm not talking about Brian McHenry, but I'm actually talking about the grocery companies. Now, the industry, this particular industry is actually growing very quickly. And um, it, the interesting part is most businesses are trying to find ways to scale that out. And in some cases, they're actually implementing self-driving grocery del delivery. Now, this is they don't have to pay any more humans to actually deliver. Uh, and in this case, Neuro has this company called Neuro has actually created a bot that can drive itself down the streets and it can hold eggs, toilet paper, hot dogs, and any other kind of groceries to your home. Now, the question is here, and this is what this popular science article brings up, is what if self-driving vehicles ran into a no-win situation? Like for in a case of a pedestrian or an animal, well, now what would it do? Now, would it sacrifice all of its stock and its profit to save a human or animal, or would it just kind of handle it? And so technology-wise, in the device itself, it has a spinning laser on the unit on the top called a LiDAR, and it uses light to measure the distance from the from the vehicle to objects. It also has cameras, radar units, and it gives it that 360-degree uh, view of the world. And they also have uh, ways to measure velocity of moving objects near it, and it has access to a map and as well as GPS. Now, the company actually calls out that since it's no longer trying to protect, protect onboard humans who are actually in the car uh, from injury, it can actually perform a self-sacrificing maneuver in order to save people and animals around it. Now, Neuro is actually quoted as saying, they will always choose to drive into the tree. Now, for some reason, this kind of brings back memories of the movie Flight of the Navigator when David decided to actually ride on that robotic meal cart. But anyways, that's besides the point. I'm, I'm kind of thinking from the fact of the interesting thing, I want to take devil's advocate approach here. I want to throw it over to you guys and, and see what you think. Is The interesting thing is they said, hey, we have we don't have to protect anything on board. And so it's really easy for us to code this up and say, you know what, we'll just sacrifice the unit and we'll save everything else around us. But what if I, what if what if they didn't have to do that? What if what if they actually had to uh, worry about onboard onboard people? Is this something this is a this is going to be a big AI challenge going forward, right? For any for any device, any manufacturer of autonomous vehicles. Either one of you. So so is is this where we start to finally see uh, Asimov's three laws come into play in real life? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I guess that's the question is, is this it, obviously uh, in some cases, this is, it's there's a no win situation here, right? Because you have onboarding people, onboard people and people around the unit. Um, you know, what can you do? What you're supposed to do? Asimov's uh, three laws say you, you should do no harm to humans. Well, in that case, there's probably no way to not do harm to humans. So the question would be, how do they how do they make that decision? Is the company's going to have to start worrying about that? Well, I've been waiting for a self-driving vehicle since uh, that, that movie Minority Report. I mean, forget the flying hoverboard. I want to be able to do anything other than drive while I'm driving. So my fingers are just crossed on this. I think this is a great way to do uh, the proof of concept and, and get the wrinkles out of the technology and get and maybe uh, make a catalyst for getting broader acceptance for the self-driving technology as a whole. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. I think they're basically using this as a training bed, a test bench for them to just verify the technology 
you know, obviously around all the different sensors and the units around there. And they're using it for a good cause. They're delivering things uh, that people need. Um, let's just hope that people don't find a way to use this in a different way. Um, but hopefully it's just used for groceries. Um, the, the question would be maybe to you, uh, Bam, as well as it runs security is like from the enterprise perspective, you know, customers are going to expect that, hey, like even though you're delivering stuff to me and you're doing it autonomously, there has to be a way to secure my location, secure my data in, in transit, so on and so forth. You know, what do companies have to do for this type of thing? I, I would not want to be the security engineer uh, responsible for assessing the 360 degree risk on this platform. Um, it, it's it's not it's you know so you have all the consumer data stuff that we just talked about, uh, but think about you know what's you know what's to stop somebody? We just had you know uh, some research come out at Black Hat a couple of weeks ago that I reported on was you know, there are fleets of emergency response vehicles with cellular gateways on board that were largely very, very vulnerable uh, to compromise. Now, we haven't heard of instances of Tesla self or other self-driving cars that are out there getting hacked, uh, but we have had the research that uh, Charlie Miller and um, uh, I can't remember, Chris Valasek, I was about to say his Twitter handle, um, put out there, you know, they hacked Jeeps and Chryslers and all these infotainment system and showed that they could, you know, take over a car at a distance while it was on the road. Um, you know, there, there's a million ways that this could be compromised and used for evil, uh, not just the consumer data, but, you know, what happens when somebody decides that they just want to co-opt this AI to make it do something bad on the road? You know, we have, um, what was the, what was the, you know, pick one of the impossible mission movies where they control all the traffic lights and, um, you know, <laughs> clear the lane right. for people. Imagine, imagine that scenario where the, where the fleet of vehicles is, uh, available for compromise and control. Right. Yeah. I think Heather, I want to throw over to you and, uh, the interesting thing is this is potentially creating a new market for most businesses, right? We're, we're talking not only um, uh, this this small grocery. I think Kroger is actually jo jo dropping money on this particular unit. But this opens the door for companies like Amazon and other enterprises to start doing this as well, especially if this is successful, right? Well, right. Build it and they will come. But also, um, you guys are a lot younger than me, so you don't remember that uh, m maybe... Uh, in the uh, 90s, before the dot-com bust, there were uh, supermarkets that were actually experimenting with these online orders and, and uh, home delivery. Um, and in Texas, that's pretty much the only way to get your ice cream home without mel it melting. Um, so even though most of us were on, uh, there wasn't a big inter uh, internet uptake rate at that point. And so we were all still on DSL rates. Trying to get a graphics intensive website to load and order your groceries took longer than if you had just gone to the grocery store and ordered them the yourself. And it didn't last long. In fact, um, out here, it probably lasted just about a summer before um, they just weren't able to make money on it. So I, aside from the fact that I'm hoping this is a proof of concept so I can finally get behind a car that doesn't have a wheel and I can just go places without having to think about it um i'm i'm looking forward to home delivery me too yeah. i'm you actually know, i'm hoping they're uh, successful yeah i mean i've, I've you know we're, we're we're doing you know sort of weekly meal delivery here as well as, and we use online shopping so we go and pick up the the you know we sh fill up the whole cart and then we go down to the supermarket and they have it ready for us we just load it up so if anything i can do to avoid being at the supermarket is a uh, is on the plus side of things. And actually, I am old enough to remember uh, Fresh Direct being launched because I was out here in my neck of the woods on the East Coast. I was, yeah, right. Yeah, and I think in Texas, even, we had Tom Thumb. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even Amazon Fresh has started out in this in this area. And I'll tell you, like they even the produce, we would say, hey, we would go and order the produce and we would order at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And then, you know, wake up in the morning, six, seven o'clock in the morning, and there it is on your doorstep. And in fact, they actually did a pretty good job of picking the fresh stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopes that this actually turns out well, helps reduce their costs in that case. Um, and it makes these types of services more prevalent. We'll have to see what happens. Well, folks, I think that does it for the bites. Next up, we have a really super great guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiat Riot. But first, we have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. And that's DigitalOcean. Now, as a developer, I can tell you the ability to experiment with your apps on a truly hosted environment is sometimes hard. And now if it was easier to deploy to hosted services, you could focus more on innovation rather than on the logistics. Now, DigitalOcean 
removes that impedance of cloud deployments and hosting, and they make it easier than ever to deploy your apps and your code, store things on the cloud storage without all the steps in between. Now, not only do I love DigitalOcean, but I also love the way they name things. Now, starting out with DigitalOcean's droplets, which are actually super scalable virtual machines that you can add on storage, security, monitoring capabilities with just one click of a button, but they're also really great at one click deployment models. And that is, makes it really easy for you to bootstrap your project. Now, you want a specific distribution of Linux? Well, one click deploy Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, and more. How about one click deploy an application or application stack? Well, you can add Docker, LAMP, MongoDB, Node.js, MySQL, and more with just one click. And not only is it easy to deploy, it's actually super easy to manage as well. Now, VM snapshots are super simple to take and manage. Now, for me, that gives me peace of mind that my last known good state is always just one click away. But they also offer team management and unified collaborations. That, that actually helps your teams manage and scale your infrastructure and apps. Now, you need more security for your infrastructure? Well, there's actually one-click add a firewall for your droplet as well or your droplet groups. Now, get this. Cloud firewalls are Free. Now, don't let that free tag fool you. These firewalls are not just some low-tier system for just testing environments. They're actually production-ready firewalls that can scale with your business. Now, to meet the demands of the market, DigitalOcean follows this great pay-for-play pricing. It's not only clear and concise, it also helps... Um, you kind of model out your demands of your application as the service grows. And there's no more complexity that comes with understanding your future bills or paying your current ones. Now, if you want to add more storage, go ahead and add more block storage to meet the needs of your application. Just 10 cents per gigabyte per month. And you have to worry less about adding more peace of mind in your application, especially to your back end there. Now, if your site starts to scale and it becomes more popular, well, load balancers are highly available, fully managed services that work right out of the box and can be deployed as fast as a click of a button for your droplet. Now, if you're like me, you love to write scripts and manage things remotely. Now, DigitalOcean has you covered. As an API guy, I can tell you that they do have some pretty great APIs. They just use standard HTTP requests to deploy and manage thousands of your droplets and resources in just a simple programmatic way. Now, there are tons of reasons you should consider DigitalOcean, even some of the extra stuff they don't charge you for, like 99.99% uptime SLA, full DNS management, and more. Now, DigitalOcean truly has you covered. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't go out right now and try DigitalOcean, especially to support this week in Enterprise Tech. So go to do.co slash enterprise right now. Even if you think you might start a project in the future, you might as well go out right now, get yourself set up. If you sign up today, you can receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash enterprise. That's do.co slash enterprise for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's that time of the show. We, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And this time, it's no exception. We have Andrew Osted, co-founder and chief product officer of Airtable. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So, you know, all our audience loves to hear about people's backgrounds, their origins. Can you just give a quick summary of your kind of journey through the world of tech? Yeah, sure. So I went to college studying electrical engineering and did a lot of computer science stuff on the side programming. I was really into game engines at the time and video games. So sort of my entrance into, uh, you know, software. And I think through college, I realized that software is just this amazing creative medium where you can really without any capital costs, just build anything that you can imagine. So uh, got into that, and and my first job out of college was actually at Accenture, the uh, technology consulting firm. They had a research department. Basically, what we did was we built demos for Fortune 500 clients. Um, you know, at the time, the iPhone had just come out, so we just built these iPhone applications and kind of rich enterprise applications. Um, after that, I worked for Google. I was a product manager on Android in the early days, right when the Droid came out, and it's sort of the beginning of the kind of meteoric rise of Android. And then I was on Google Maps for three years. And so I've always like really enjoyed products and projects where you're kind of taking this, these really complicated, uh, you know, things like Google Maps at the time had like all this, this data and these features. And we, the project I worked on was really simplifying that and, and trying to, uh, you know, really, really pack a lot of functionality into a, a really simple UI. So um, yeah, it's kind of my background. And uh, you know, started Airtable about six years ago with, uh, you know, some friends from college who were sort of tech nerds along with me back then. 
Uh, I've been working on the product for quite a while, just, you know, took us a long time to get the product right. And, you know, obviously spent a lot of time on just taking this really powerful thing, which is a database and making it uh, simple and elegant for anybody to be able to adopt. Right, right, right. Now you, you mentioned your co your other co-founders, you seem to be in good, good company there. I think Howie Lou actually started ETAX, right? Which is like a, which was then eventually sold to Salesforce. And then I think it was Emmett Nichols, who's also a founding engineer of Stack Overflow, right? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So uh, Howie, we uh, again we're friends in college, and um, he he uh, basically started this company Etax, which is a Y Combinator startup, spot by Salesforce. Um, and I think you know a lot of the motivation for Airtable and the inspiration came from his experience there, where he basically saw that you know most business software and most enterprise software is basically just like a relational database with some simple views and some kind of workflow and triggers on top of it. So, uh, but, you know, of course, Salesforce and other products out there are incredibly complicated and sort of the bar to actually being able to adopt them is pretty high. So, uh, and, and similarly, I think Emin and I were really, you know, interested in this, this world of creative tools and, and basically creating things that make it way easier for, you know, normal, normal users to basically adopt things that were only accessible before to programmers and, and very technical people. So, yeah, we sort of rallied around, around the idea and uh, have been working on it for, ever since. Fantastic. Now, now I know that there's tons of organizations out there that essentially run their business on spreadsheets. People run events and team events. That's kind mm -hmm. of the lifeblood of the spreadsheet. What is what is Airtable trying to solve for that for the average user that's kind of essentially using spreadsheets today? Um, and what what do they get out of the kind of the database side of things too as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we think of Airtable as this really a software Lego kit that lets anybody kind of build custom business applications. Um, and, you know, to your point, a lot of people kind of do this with spreadsheets where it's this incredibly flexible you know, piece of software. Uh, but, but the fact is spreadsheets were invented a long time ago for the purposes of number crunching and financial analysis. And uh, people happen to use them as, as more of a table where you're keeping a list or you're keeping track of a bunch of things. But uh, really, you know, the relational database structure is much better for that type of use case. And uh, so, so we, from sort of day one, have built Airtable around a database. But, uh, you know, spreadsheet is great. We're huge fans and have a ton of respect for spreadsheets just because they're really simple to use. And it's this really clean uh, kind of visual table metaphor that people can really pick up right away. And so we, we sort of try to take the best pieces of that and the best pieces of that immediate spreadsheet UI, where it's just kind of like this table and really apply that to a database, which is a much better structure for uh, keeping track of data and especially interrelated data, where you basically need to link different pieces of, um, you know, different records to other records and different tables. So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, a relational database just is better at reflecting sort of, you know, uh, the type of data that people are trying to keep track of on a daily basis and in, in their work lives. Got it. So. When, when you think of databases, you think, you know, nowadays, obviously, cloud databases, you think a little bit about data consistency, transactions, scale, replication, you know, failover, those types of things. Does does Airflow follow any of these things when it comes to organizations that might be have tech savvy people that want to be able to do those types of things? Yeah, so really what we try to do is abstract away all those complexities from the end user. And we've put a tremendous amount of effort into the engineering to kind of take those complexities and, and just make them super simple and straightforward. So, uh, you know, we do have things like type fields. So you can have a, a field that takes an attachment or it takes a number and it doesn't allow you to enter like a text string, for example. Uh, or we have like a select field where you can kind of pre-specify the set of options that a user can select and they can't select anything outside of that. Um, so we, we sort of do that in a very friendly, easy way for the user. And in terms of the transactions, we've, we've built a pretty robust real-time architecture similar to Google Docs where, you know, every change, every keystroke is synced in real time, not only to the server, but to all other clients that have Airtable open. So everything is synced in real time. Um, you know, we put a lot of effort into making sure that there are no uh, conflicts and, and that type of thing. And on top of that, we, we have things like snapshots so that if you uh, mess something up in a big way, First of all, you can undo it really easily. And second of all, you can always roll back to a previous snapshot. So we just like do a lot of that by default. And it's not a lot of effort or uh, you know, thought for the user to actually uh, use those things. So, so that's like a lot of the engineering that went into the product is just kind of making all that really seamless and, and almost invisible to the user. Right. So you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit. You know, when you, sometimes when you make things more, more accessible, sometimes mm -hmm. you abstract away that complexity 
And that can actually sometimes make things less flexible, sometimes not mobile. So how did how is how is Airtable kind of solving this? Can you can you let's say take your Airtable or your table offline? Can it be used like while you're on the train somewhere? Is it is it become flexible like that, or is it is still in the works for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we don't support offline mode right now. It's something we're considering. Um, it's obviously a huge effort. Uh, there are also complexities like. What do you do if somebody's been off long, uh, offline for multiple days at a time? They come back, and uh, you know, I think people when they use Airtable, especially teams, they are using it on a daily basis and constantly editing and adding data. And you have to have some uh, not only technical way, but some product UI to kind of merge all those changes together without kind of uh, unintentionally deleting changes that have happened since you've been offline. So we've been thinking about that problem for a long time. We haven't actually implemented it yet. And, um, you know, I, I think in the real world, a lot of times, at least what we see with our customers is that they're uh, really running sort of their business processes and they're actively using Airtable at their desks at work most of the time. And obviously we have mobile apps that uh, allow you to kind of search for records and use the product out uh, when you have a connection. But um, mm -hmm. I think we, we've been a little bit surprised about, uh, you know, how. Uh, how little sort of, I mean, we definitely do get requests for offline mode, but compared to other things, other things people want, like a sort of more permissions and, and uh, you know, kind of platform developer features and that type of thing, we actually have been a little bit surprised about how, uh, how, how like the offline mode isn't quite as important as some of those other things. Got it. Yeah, I think you kind of uh, mentioned this a little bit is around collaboration, because a lot of times people are online, they're editing the same document all at once. How, how does Airtable maybe handle collab in that case? Yeah, so everything is synced in real time. Um, and basically, we, we have to do a lot of complicated stuff. Like, you know, sometimes you can you have the typed column. So it could be like a, uh, you know, a select field, for example. And then somebody could be typing in a field or adding a select value. And then somebody else converts a column. And you have to basically, you know, transform some of those changes to the new column type. So there are a lot of like idiosyncrasies like that you have to deal with in a lot of edge cases. And uh, yeah, we just put a lot of effort into that. Um, you know, it took us three years or so to kind of get the foundation of Airtable into place. And we were sort of in beta for a long time. And I, th I think compared to most companies, we just really uh, were dedicated to kind of building out that technical infrastructure and kind of solving those hard problems that made things very easy for the for the user. So um, yeah, the answer to that is it's, it's all complicated and, and sort of um, a lot of edge cases you have to deal with and uh, just kind of a lot of hard problems. But we, we've sort of like uh, have laid a good foundation for the product by just kind of cranking in those for, for a long time with a really solid team. Right. Yeah, obviously, Collab is a, is a big feature for people, especially with spreadsheets and so on. But another thing that I, we, we tend to find is kind of the ability to create macros. Like, for instance, if I'm just a, a normal average user of a spreadsheet, don't understand databases, but I'm entering data and I keep entering the same thing over and over again and I have to be able to do this kind of thing over and over again, I want to be able to record a macro to kind of produce that. Now, I think Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel, they kind of allow you to record macros and perform this operations over and over again. Does, 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 does Airtable handle that type of scenario? Yeah, it's a good question. So we uh, we don't have macros per se, but we do have this uh, blocks platform, and and blocks are essentially little mini applications you can install on top of your Airtable bases. So we have a gallery of blocks that you can go and look at, and and some of these are visualizations like charts. Um, other others are are like you said, they allow you to sort of take bulk actions on on your records. So you can say, uh, you know, look at this filtered view of of this set of records and update all the fields in this way. Um, and we actually have a few blocks that pull in, plug into different APIs. So one really cool example is the we have a Google Cloud Vision block. And what that does is if you have a field in Airtable, a, a column that has attachments, it will basically, uh, you know, you specify that in the block and then that it will use, use look at those attachments and figure out what is in the attachments using the Cloud Vision API. So uh, one cool example of that is we uh, have a customer um, Insomniac events that puts on this music festival called Electric Daisy Carnival. And of course, people lose a lot of stuff there. So they have a lost and found that they run with Airtable. And whenever somebody loses an item, they find a lost item, they take a picture of it in Airtable. And uh, they're able to use the Cloud Vision API to then go and, and tag all those pictures. So if it's a red backpack, there'll be a field that says this is a red backpack. And then they can easily search that. So um, 
not only can you sort of like do these bulk updates, but you can also with blocks plug into this world of APIs, like really powerful APIs, including a lot of the Google machine learning and cloud vision APIs. Um, and, right. and that's something that you definitely don't get in a spreadsheet. That's awesome. So, so that leads me to my next question. Now the, now the market, um, obviously spreadsheets, you talked about spreadsheets have been around for a while. Um, the concept of the spreadsheet, obviously Google, um, some of these other companies, they make it seem like you're kind of interacting with the database. They're online. It's, it seems to be kind of a clouded market. There's Intuit QuickBase. There's Quip Sheets from Salesforce. There's Google Sheets. There's Coda, Microsoft Access, Microsoft Excel. Like, what what is you talked a little bit about the kind of the workflows and these these um, additional things you can do with it, but. What what are what are some of the other things that Airtable is kind of bringing the market that you're saying, hey, like instead of using those, use us because we do this. Yeah, I think I mean like most of the products that you mentioned are spreadsheets, so the structure is just fundamentally different. And I, you know, a spreadsheet is basically just kind of a, a sea of cells, and there's so so there's no um, kind of predefined structure over how you organize information. And that prevents you from doing a lot of things like, uh, you know, knowing that something is an attachment uh, column and then you can sort of have blocks that know to look at that to kind of, you know, uh, do things like the Cloud Vision API. Um, so, yeah, I think like it's just a completely different structure than a spreadsheet and, and uh, you know, it's kind of fundamentally better for keeping track of, of things in the real world, whether that be ideas or projects or people for, you know, kind of CRM use cases. Uh, and I think you mentioned a few existing database products um, a lot of those are just, you know, kind of clunky. They're hard to use. You have to kind of understand uh, what a database is and what things like a foreign key is before you can actually kind of go in and do them. So you sort of have to do like a lot of upfront schema configuration before you can just kind of get down to kind of listing out the items you're you're actually thinking about. Um, so yeah, I would say that like we we went over those products by just kind of having a, a much better kind of consumer grade product that's uh, real time collaborative. So I think a lot of those uh, you know kind of legacy products like FileMaker and Access they uh, they're kind of you know desktop pieces of software and they don't um, you know they just don't have the collaborative features that you'd uh, expect from a modern modern tool. So um, yeah, I think I think it's sort of we're we're fundamentally different in a spreadsheet and. Uh, and kind of it, it, the database allows you to, to gives you the foundation that you can use to kind of build app like functionality on top of it. And separately, the sort of older products that, uh, you know, we've definitely taken inspiration from things like Access and FileMaker and this previous predecessor of database products. But they really mm -hmm. just haven't uh, kind of gotten up to to modern times and the collaborative uh, mobile world that we, we're in today. Makes sense. So I do want to bring my co-hosts in. I think uh, starting with Brian McHenry, I think you had some questions about adoption, right, Brian? Yeah, so I think this this sounds like an amazing technology to get you know the more non technical user who might be intimidated by uh, the the barrier to entry for relational database programming. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm more interested in, of how this kind of brings everybody together, and you know how do you get a you know a so called power user, a coder, or developer to really embrace a technology like this and not dismiss it as not for them. Yeah, it's actually interesting because our best customers and the ones that get most excited about Airtable are oftentimes not coders. And instead, they they are people who, uh, you know, it's a very bottoms up product where everybody within an organization can sort of adopt this to uh, to really kind of build the application of, of their dreams. And, uh, you know, it's like marketers, designers, product managers who have a deep understanding of the, the business they're in and the kind of tool they need for their specific project or process. And with Airtable, they're they're able to actually create the perfect uh, piece of software for that. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily programmers who are the the uh, you know the early adopters for us. A lot of times, it's uh, just just people who have a problem and they have an idea of what they want to do, but they they really haven't had the software tools to kind of put that into into software uh, until until they've discovered Airtable. Um, so yeah, I think the interesting part is it's it's not uh, you know a technical audience necessarily that who's the early adopter. Um, given they are usually kind of tinkers and they're they're ambitious and they're creative and and they uh, they sort of generally are have kind of an entrepreneurial spirit. But I think the interesting part is that our customers are pretty diverse and you know both geographically and and in terms of their technical ability. But uh, they're sort of driven to kind of uh, build build software for a, a process they want to uh, to to put in place to help run their team better and and to really do a much better job at their job. Right, right, right. I think uh, Mo actually had a question about adoption as well from the flip side, from the non-techie person, right, Mo? 
Yeah, actually, I have a couple of comments, and then I'd like to get your uh, your take on it. The first, my first observation is that it, this sounds like you're taking uh, the concept of use the right tool for the right job, and then wrapping a kinder, gentler interface on it so that it does lower that barrier to entry. Um, and and so I'll let you comment on that in a little bit. But uh, this week there was a really interesting Twitter conversation that was started by uh, Jeff Blankenberg um, from Alexa. Um, he was describing his ninth grade daughter's experience in uh, her first computer science class. And his main point was about improving diversity in tech and, and that we really have to start at the elementary school level. Um, but then he made a good comment about his feeling in the near future that almost all jobs will require the ability to write some code, whether it's to write reports or interact with robots. Um, but being able to uh, write some code is going to be the new differentiator, uh, if you will. And it seems like Airtable is really um, allowing that reality to come even faster. Yeah, absolutely. That's always been our, our uh, you know, dream is basically to kind of lower that barrier to software creation, where today, if you want to go build an application to, uh, for example, you know, uh, run a video production pipeline for, for a company you're working for, you, uh, you have to learn all these things. You have to learn how to code. You have to learn how to, you know, uh, host the, the, the piece of software on a server somewhere. And it's just like ridiculously hard to do that. And uh, with Airtable, we're sort of taking uh, the, the kind of fundamental components that programmers use to build the, these pieces of software, like a database, uh, you know, some views on top of that, and, uh, you know, all these kind of uh, other aspects that we'll, you can kind of like mix and match with blocks and different fields and everything else. And we're uh, putting them, you know, giving them to the user in a very friendly format um, that's not intimidating. And, and I think the familiarity with the spreadsheet and, and just kind of the simplicity of the interface, which we've, uh, you know, qu kind of worked long and hard to uh, to make really simple and elegant, it definitely like lowers that bar. And, and uh, I think sometimes without people even knowing that they're creating software, they uh, they just kind of start using it and they kind of, uh, you know, once they have something in there that they kind of understand, they're, they're able to add on these layers of complexity. And, and before you know it, you're sort of building software. So um, yeah, it's definitely the the idea of the product. And, um, and I think that's why, especially non-developers get so excited about it is because it opens up this entirely new sort of creative form for them, which is kind of building useful software that that is uh, very empowering. Well, that explains why I'm excited about it, because as a Wi-Fi engineer, I like to stay at layer two. I don't I get air uh, altitude sickness if I go too high up, but this looks pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Thanks a lot. So I think, Pam, you had questions about even adoption as well as in grade schools and so on, right? Yeah, I've always been pretty passionate about, um, you know, putting technology in the hands of, of, of kids, you know, part of that's, you know, being a dad. And uh, I have one son who really doesn't want anything to do with technology uh, other than his iPhone. And then another one who's, who's kind of embraced everything in the gamut. Um, is Airtable doing anything to engage, you know, K through 12, say, you know, going, you know, sort of doing outreach? I mean, I know that, um, as a startup, it might be a little bit ambitious uh, to, to doing something uh, more philanthropic like that. But I, I really see this as a tool that you could use uh, to engage uh, kids at a young age who are, you know, get them, you know, the easiest way to get a kid excited about doing something I found is just what you said. Don't tell them they're building an app. Just give them a tool and then see what they do with it. Yeah, definitely. It's it's not something we're actively uh, kind of pushing on now, but I could certainly see us doing a lot more education. Um, and, and certainly we've heard of classes that kind of teach computer science and database fundamentals through Airtable. So I definitely think it's it's a great way to learn that. And especially it's such a kind of visual metaphor for databases and data in general that I think it's uh, you know, it's a great way to sort of get those concepts across in a, a very visual way. And especially if you put it in terms that students understand. So, you know, if like uh, here's a table of, of classrooms and here's a separate table of students. And now that's sort of like with a kind of foreign key relationship, link up the students to the classes. And once you kind of put it in those real world uh, terms, it's much easier to grasp than it would be if you're describing something in, you know, complete, completely abstract terms. So, um, so yeah, I think you can sort of use it and, and uh, kind of set up scenarios where students are solving real problems or they're working with real data they have in their lives. And that, that's a great way for, to teach th those concepts. Uh, we, we think a lot about, or we, we read a lot about some of the, uh, you know, some of the ideas around making programming easier and 
uh, going back to when I was uh, a kid, we we did logo and and you'd use hypercard and there's this concept of a turtle and just having like this very uh, and and the idea is it was like this little turtle you had in the screen and you could give it instructions of which direction to go, uh, but just kind of like that metaphor of like here's a turtle and you're telling the turtle what to do makes uh, programming much less abstract and and a lot easier to understand. So we're definitely uh, super excited about the possibility of using Airtable as an educational tool. Right. So we, we had actually an interesting question from the chat room. Beatree asked, you know, we know you have box integrations, allows you to kind of integrate. Um, what about what about import and export and kind of data formats for that? Yeah, it's a good question. We we support import of CSV and also a calendar and XML. Some of those you can import through special blocks we have. And for as far as export goes, you can export as well through CSV. Uh, but we also just try to make it really easy to copy and paste in and out of Airtable, so we kind of uh, support all the the standard copy and paste features you'd expect. So, um, and then the third thing I'll add is that we have a pretty robust API. So if you create an Airtable base, we'll actually create an API explicitly for that base. So you know, there's an endpoint to list all the records in this table or that table. Uh, or uh, to, to write records. So if you're a developer, you can always uh, kind of get, get your data uh, and, and do anything you want with it through the API as well. That's cool. So obviously organizations, no matter how big or small, they, they worry a little bit about, they worry a lot about security nowadays. Now, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what is kind of Airtable doing to secure data? Yeah, that's a great question. We we definitely you know follow the best practices there, and we spend a lot on sort of bug bounty programs, uh, penetration tests, and we take it very seriously just because we realize first of all how important it is, and and uh, you know second of all you know it's just like it's in our best interest not to have uh, any type of breach. You know, it's hugely important to our customers, so we we uh, take it very seriously. Um, so I think the other part of that is that, uh, you know, even if you have the best security for enterprises, a lot of it comes down to educating uh, folks who are using the product. So, you know, even if, if uh, it's really hard to, um, you know, penetrate Airtable uh, externally, like if you have somebody within the organization that shares externally for any reason, uh, be it accidental or not, I think, uh, you know, that's a bad, very bad scenario. So we're constantly thinking of ways to uh, make, make those situations harder uh, for, for enterprises customers and, and just sort of like make all the UI very clear around uh, collaboration and everything else to, to ensure that, uh, you know, data doesn't uh, accidentally sort of leave, leave the workplace. Right. Now, I, I think I'm, I was reading your docs and it says that Airtable claims that it encrypts both in root and on its servers. You use what, 256-bit SSL? Uh, mm -hmm. in transit and then 256 AES encryption when it's at rest. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Now, are there yeah. any plans to potentially move to maybe two-factor auth and some of these other kind of added security measures? Yeah, we do support two-factor auth. So we've we've had that for quite a while and it's, um, yeah, it's definitely something we encourage with all our customers. And uh, we're working on an enterprise feature where if you uh, kind of adopt, you know, our enterprise plan, you can enforce two-factor authentication because right now it's voluntary. But uh, yeah, definitely we follow all the best practices and uh, are constantly trying to figure out ways to, to make it even more secure. Fantastic. And Brian, you had a little bit, you had a question about features. Yeah, actually, just more of a fun question. I'm interested to know, like, in your opinion, as you travel around, you talk to your customers, what is the coolest or most surprising thing you've seen built? I, I think one of the things I love seeing is is when you design something, a product, a platform, you have an idea of what you think you, people will build or create or or do with those products. But uh, the the most fulfilling things are the things that you never saw coming. And, and so I'm just interested with such a creative platform. What's the coolest thing or most surprising thing you've seen a customer build? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's definitely one of the funnest parts of working on a completely horizontal product like this is that uh, you're sort of always amazed by the creativity of your customers. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had all sorts of really cool use cases, uh, you know, from cattle ranchers, for example, who use Airtable to track their, all their, their, the cattle in their farm and basically run every aspect of their, their ranch to, um, you know, science fiction authors have kind of created these really complete and, and, uh, in-depth sci-fi worlds in Airtable that are very consistent. So, you, you know, they have all these planets and all these different characters and factions all kind of like linked together in Airtable, um, to, to really inspiring stuff like, during natural disasters, we've seen Airtable used for disaster coordination, as well as uh, one kind of cool one is there was a 
pet rescue effort when there were, um, you know, a disaster somewhere. So I, I think like there's a lot of inspiring stuff like that where it's actually having a big impact. And I think especially the flexibility of the product uh, allows people to kind of really, you know, adapt it to their very idiosyncratic needs. And, and uh, some of the stuff you see, you could just never predict. Right. So one thing I, you know, we're getting a little bit low on time. I wanted to kind of throw it out to you. So if some, obviously we have all of our audiences, the type of tinkers that like to try things out. Obviously, I have lots of big organizations that listen as well. Now, if an organization or an individual wanted to get started, what do they have to do to kind of get started? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You just go to Airtable.com. We provide a lot of templates as well as uh, we have a site called Universe, which shows kind of the ways that our customers are, are uh, using the product. So, yeah, there it is. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy. You can start with a template to kind of get inspiration. You can also start from scratch or import a spreadsheet. And, uh, you know, if you have, you have questions, we have pretty extensive help documentation uh, as well as a, a very uh, responsive customer support team. So, yeah, just go to Airtable.com and sign up and, and uh, go ahead and go kick the wheels. Um, I should also mention that we have a free plan uh, that, that you can use indefinitely. And uh, but we do provide kind of a, a premium set of, of features and some things like blocks are, are only on our pro plan. But you're you're definitely welcome to use the product for however long it takes to kind of realize the full value of it. That's fantastic. Well, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time. You've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise show according to nine out of 10 data tables. I want to thank our panelists for dropping some knowledge on the Twyat Rise, starting with my co one of my co-hosts in crime, Mr. Brian Henry. Brian, always a pleasure having you, sir. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work? Uh, at my Twitter handle, you see it on screen, at BA McHenry as well as over on devcentral.f5.com, which is our uh, very active community site where you'll find a lot of how to and how to kind of take really complex top technology from F5 and make it into simple solutions. Fantastic. Of course, I have to thank our other co-host in crime, Heather Williams. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work? Hey, I'm settling back in here at the little log cabin at the lake. So I'm uh, I'm happy to not be on the road for uh, as I have been for the last month. I'm at uh, Mo Better Wi-Fi, um, where I'm mostly just making snarky comments, um, and I am uh, I'm very happy to just settling into my my regular day job of just writing best practice design guides and things like that instead of just traveling all the time. <laughs> I get that. Well, we, we're definitely gr grateful that you're here. Thank you for being here, Heather. Well, we, of course, we want to thank our guest, Andrew Ofsted, co-founder and chief product officer of Airtable. I want to give you a chance, 30 seconds, maybe tell the folks at home where they can find you, your work, and a little bit about Airtable. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I don't tweet much, so you can just go follow Airtable if you're interested in developments of the product. Uh, Airtable.com, sign up, check it out, and... Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we have customers from tech companies like Medium to marketing teams at companies like Kohan and WeWork who use Airtable to, you know, large traditional enterprise companies. Um, so I, I think whatever you're doing, you can probably find some value in the product and, uh, you know, but the proof is in the pudding. So check it out, Airtable.com. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. We also want to thank you. You tune each, each and every week. We couldn't do the show without you. You are our loyal listeners and our followers. We want to make sure that you have it's easy for you to tune in each and every week. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen. So go to the page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, plus all the show notes, our co-host information, guest information, and the links to the stories during the show. But more importantly, next to the videos there, there's that little magic set of buttons there just to subscribe to your format of your choice, both audio, video, HD video, and on the device of your choice, both phone, tablet, laptop, or desktop. And after you subscribe, share that show with your friends, families, and coworkers. We love doing the show. And with your support, we can definitely keep doing it. Now, after you subscribe, also remember, we do the show live each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. Come see how the pizza is made live. See the behind the scenes secrets of the trade. And if you're going to jump in live and join live, you might as well jump into the chat room as well as irc.twit.tv. We love our chat room and we always get really great material to talk about from them. Also, don't forget to follow me. All my interesting discussions on Twitter at twitter.com slash M. Of course, you can find all of my daily work at Microsoft at dev.office.com where you can find all the latest and greatest ways to customize Office and make it more productive. I also want to thank 
each and every person that makes this show possible, especially thank you to Leo and Lisa who continue to support us each and every week to do this week in enterprise tech. And of course, our amazing producer, Brian Chibert, Brian Chi, who's actually in a hurricane right now. Uh, and he's actually in our docs and in our RC channel uh, on a sat modem. So he is definitely dedicated and we thank you for all of his work and all of his time on this. But of course, before we sign out, I of course want to thank our TD today, Victor. Thank you for being here, sir. Of course, I want to continue our tradition of uh, talking to the TDs and and ask you what was the main subject of the show today. Uh, <laughs> Airtable. Ah, very very close. It was spreadsheets and databases, but maybe ne next time. Thank you so much, Victor. It's on the tip <laughs> of my <laughs> tongue. Force. Until <laughs> next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise. Just keep quiet. Sweet.